now on KGW News. A Portland police officer is punched as another protest turns violent. A local college becomes one of the first to require students get the COVID vaccine. Plus, it's kind of shocking. Yeah, in a good way. A pleasant surprise for Washington restaurants and bars working to make up for lost revenue. We begin at 11 with new developments in a plane crash in Camas this evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Laurel Porter. We have now confirmed one person was killed and a second was taken to the hospital. The small plane went down into what appears to be a hangar at the Grove Field Airport. A witness tells us they saw the plane practicing touch and go landings just before this happened. The NTSB and FAA will be out tomorrow morning to try to figure out what went wrong. The numbers are not going in the right direction in the pandemic. Washington's health director today warned we're at the beginning of a fourth wave and Oregon's numbers are on a similar trajectory. Oregon reported 998 new COVID cases tonight. We haven't seen that many cases reported in a day since the beginning of February. Hospitalizations are also increasing. Now this will be an important number to watch moving forward. Right now about 270 people are in the hospital with COVID. If that number gets above 300 and continues to increase, some counties would be forced to go back to more severe restrictions like closing indoor dining. New tonight, a local college has become one of the first to announce it will require students to get the COVID vaccine. Lewis and Clark College in Southwest Portland will make students show proof of vaccination before returning to school in the fall. Our Mike Benner found out some students will be exempt. Since the onset of the pandemic, Lewis and Clark College has made it a priority to offer in-person classes to its thousands of students. Junior Rory Bialystowski says he's felt safe on the Southwest Portland campus. I think every, everybody takes it really seriously, all the students. So when you're in a building or you're even walking outside, everybody's got their mask on. The international affairs major, who happens to also sit on the Westland City Council, says there is plenty of social distancing in the Lewis and Clark classrooms, too. And it's about to get even safer on campus. The vaccine is the way forward and the way to kind of return to the normal college experience that we all like. And want. Bialystowski is in support of a new mandate announced by the college Wednesday. By October 15th, all students will be required to show proof of vaccination. And we think if everybody's vaccinated, that's going to keep our students uh, the healthiest and the safest. John Hancock, Associate Dean of Students for Health and Wellness, says the college will honor medical or religious exemptions. But outside of that, students need to get fully vaccinated in order to return to campus for the fall semester. As far as students who may not be able to find a shot to the arm. Our goal, and we really hope that, that we'll be able to partner with OHA and, and the county around this, is to be able to administer a vaccine in the fall as soon as students come back. Rory Bialystowski appreciates that and looks forward to some more normalcy later this year. The vaccine policy generally will help everybody just have a more uh, comfortable feeling I did reach out to several other colleges and universities in Oregon to see where they stand on this issue. The University of Portland is monitoring the situation and could have a decision soon. Meanwhile, Oregon State University will not be requiring proof of student vaccination. They say the best way to promote and protect public health is through education of the benefits of vaccines and expanding access to vaccines, among other things. I'm Mike Benner for KGW News. We also heard back from the University of Oregon late tonight. They say they're not currently requiring students to get vaccines and they'll be watching public health recommendations to decide if they'll be required in the future. We are seeing some protest activity tonight. A small group is out near the police bureau in downtown Portland. There's been some graffiti and a small fire. Mayor Wheeler extended a state of emergency he issued yesterday in anticipation of unrest following the Derek Chauvin verdict. It now goes through noon tomorrow and allows for state police and the National Guard to respond to riots if needed. Portland saw an at times violent unlawful assembly last night. Video from the Oregonian, Oregon Live, you see it here, shows a police sergeant getting hit in the head and thrown to the ground. Other officers jumped in and hit that person trying to pull him off the sergeant. 
Police have identified the suspect as Randy Gray. He faces several charges, including assault of a public safety officer. The crowd also broke windows at a couple of Starbucks locations downtown. More people have come out calling for these destructive protests to stop. City Commissioner Mingus Maps spoke about it. He said, as a black man in one of the whitest cities in America, I appreciate my white allies. Please take a moment and have this conversation with at least three people of color. As a person of color, would trashing this Starbucks make your life better? So where does the city go from here? What will put a stop to the destruction? Dan Haggerty explored that question tonight on The Story. I have yet to hear anyone explain to me when and how this violence will end. I do know how some of you think it will end. Here's an example from an email that I recently got. This is from Ed. He says, these are radical anarchists hell bent on destroying society. It's way past time to take off the gloves and arrest all of them by any means necessary. I get emails almost every night from people who want police to take off the gloves. People who don't think police are being aggressive enough. And I can promise you, none of those people are from the Department of Justice. You see, the DOJ thinks police in this city have been going bare knuckle for a while now. They outlined recently 6,000 separate instances of use of force in just six months of last year. And this letter here from the DOJ to the city demanding action is kind of last straw territory for police, meaning if they don't make some changes and they don't present a plan for those changes, the federal government could begin the process of actually taking over our police bureau. That letter was sent on March 23rd of this year, just a couple of weeks ago. The city was given 30 days to respond. And depending on exactly how you count on the calendar, that deadline is either today or tomorrow. We reached out to police to ask if we should expect a response in time, but I haven't heard back. I discussed this with Jason Renaud with the Mental Health Association of Portland, someone who has been following this case since the beginning. We haven't heard from the city of Portland that's what the DOJ has asked for. They have asked the city to respond. Uh, if the city is not willing to do that, and they haven't been willing so far, then the issue goes to mediation, which has not been successful in the past. And if it doesn't, isn't successful in mediation, then the police bureau will go into the hands of a federal judge. How realistic do you think an outcome like that is? It's pretty good right now. You think it's a very it's a likely outcome that a judge could take over the entire police bureau in right. the near so future. So the question is, what has the police bureau done uh, since last summer to make sure that what happened last summer in the streets doesn't happen again? And I don't think they've done much. So I think we're likely going to have another difficult summer of. Uh, of demonstrations and protests, and more use of force against peaceful protesters. So what happens if the feds take over? If a judge takes over PPB? Well, they could fire and hire people if they wanted to. They could make broad changes as well. There's a lot they could do. By the way, this didn't just all happen because of the protests alone this summer. The DOJ has been looking into Portland police and asking for a plan and trying to work something out with the police force over the use of force since 2010. We took a look back at how it all started on the story at six o'clock. You can watch that report right now on the KGW YouTube channel. Investigators say yesterday's big fire at a McMinnville creamery was accidental and happened during routine maintenance. This video from Sky 8 shows the huge plume of smoke at the Organic Valley Creamery. Mark Pfeiffer with Organic Valley says most of the facility appears to be destroyed. He's grateful, though, none of the 47 employees or emergency responders was hurt. Now employees are waiting for what's next. But, you know, we've we've messaged them like, listen, you know, it's one minute, one day, you know, one hour of time. And and uh, for the next you know couple of weeks, there's, there's really nothing to worry about. Um, we're going to make sure that they get paid and uh, figure out what the next steps are. Pfeiffer says there are roughly 42 local family farms in the co-op. Their milk will now have to be processed at a different facility. He says consumers won't see any changes.